act the way it should be. And this occurs with horses that are pulling loads. So when he puts his foot on the ground, the load comes on, the carpus suddenly extends like that, and that snaps this check ligament just like you're snapping a whip and tears it. It's an interesting observation, historical observation, that back in the days of draft horses, carriage horses, cavalry, military horses, that most tendon damage was to this inferior check ligament. Damage to the superficial flexor, the so-called bowed tendon, was so seen mostly in racing horses. Today, we don't see check ligament, deep check ligament damage all that often, because we don't have cavalry, very few draft horses, except with the contest pulling horses, for example, and they do tend to snap this check ligament because of the foot coming on the ground with the carpus in this bent position so that it suddenly snaps and whips that. I can't actually whip it. You need a lot more force than I can exert. <coughs> so then we go next to the suspensory ligament, which lies here just behind the cannon bone. See it running down and then splitting into two parts, one to insert on each sesamoid bone. Now when the damage is done to the suspensory ligament, and again it tends to be more often in the horses that are pulling things, though you, it's not, certainly not restricted to them, most of the time that damage will be in one of these branches or the other, and not in the main body of the tendon. The strength of a tendon, or of anything in fact, is partially dependent upon its cross-section area. So up here, where it is a single tendon, it has a cross-section area of, we'll say, one square inch. It isn't that, but we'll say that. <clears throat> when it branches into two branches, now each branch has a half a square inch. So each branch is weaker than, than the whole tendon, which is perfectly reasonable. So when the leg is overloaded, too much weight comes on the leg or the foot impacts unevenly on the ground, stepping on a rock, stepping on the edge of a hole, for example, so that the foot drops to one side, very much like when we sprain an ankle, a human sprains an ankle from a sudden twist to one side. If a horse steps on the edge of a hole, for example, and the foot suddenly drops into the hole, it'll throw all the load or much of the load on one branch or the other, and when that happens, that will be torn and damaged and that's called a pulled suspensory. We also can have damage in, again, horses that pull things behind them at the upper end of the suspensory where it is attached to the cannon bone. I can't really see that clearly here, but it's up here where it attaches to the cannon bone just below the carpus. This tends to be, this has been seen most often in, in standard bred horses. <coughs> Now in all these instances, in all these cases of damage to these tendons, the initial clinical signs are very, very obvious. Uh, there is swelling, there's pain, the horse is limping, and usually with your fingers in the early stages you can quite readily detect whether the damage has been done to the superficial flexor or to the check ligament or to the suspensory ligament because there's swelling there in the proper places for it to be and this is readily uh, palpated by, by the fingers. What does one do about it? <clears throat> That's the $64,000 question. It is a simple fact of life that once the superficial flexor tendon has been bowed, the chances of the horse coming back and racing again successfully are less than 50 percent. It takes a minimum of nine months for this tendon to heal, no matter what you do or whatever you don't do. You can fire it, you can blister it, you can paint everything on it that you know of or have ever heard of, and it doesn't make any difference. The tendon will go on and heal at its own rate, and that will take, on average, nine to 12 months. Once it's fully healed, <coughs> it is still not a normal tendon for the simple reason that much scar tissue has been laid down in the tendon, in the damaged area, 
and that scar tissue is formed of a different kind of collagen than the original collagen that was present. These tendons are comprised primarily of what's called type 1 collagen, which is a very strong, stiff collagen. The healing process, however, is largely by types 2 and 3 collagen, which are found normally in blood vessels, for example, and they are much more elastic and not nearly as strong as the type 1 collagen. So the only real treatment for the bowed tendon is rest, and it has to be rest for a minimum of nine months with exercise gradually beginning again. And from that point on, whether you get anywhere with this bowed horse is purely a matter, I think, of luck. Can say just as un unhappy things about the deep flexor, check ligament. Once it's torn, it takes it about nine to 12 months to heal with the same things as I've said already about the superficial flexor. It's a wrong type or a different type of collagen. This is perhaps not so disabling in some horses, such as draft animals that are going at fairly slow speeds. Once the pain has subsided, they can go back and, and continue to work. But for high-speed horses like racing standard bred horses or for jumpers or contest pulling horses, this can be essentially a retirement lesion. There's nothing, no therapy, which one can apply that's of any use. There's all kinds of therapies applied, but none of them, in my opinion and my experience, are worth anything at all. The tearing of the suspensory ligament going to sound like a broken record saying the same sort of things over again because these are all tendons, they're all made of collagen, and when they're torn they all go through the same kind of a slow healing process. And there is again nothing much one can do about it except to just give them time, let nature heal as best it can, come back slowly, and hope for the best. Another quite common condition in this country in racing horses, thoroughbred race horses at least, is known as buck shin. Uh, in England, it's known as sore shin, which doesn't mean much of anything. <laughs> There's been much mystery about what a buck shin might be. Uh, most of it's been misinformed mystery. It is actually a small fracture, a crack, which occurs in this front cortex, the front part of the cannon bone, roughly here in its middle third. It occurs in the young horse, almost invariably in the young horse, uh, fairly early in the training period or in the early part of early racing period. It's lots of controversy about just why these things happen, why these fractures happen, but a general rule of this particular bone is that when it's loaded that it's in tension on the front and in compression on the back of the bone. I don't want to get too technical about this, but the horse if he puts his foot on the ground and it slides forward and suddenly stops, it will mean that the bone will tend to bow in the opposite direction. That is, it will tend to compress on the front with tension on the back. Bone is, will crack with excessive amounts of compression. So it is my opinion, at least, that this reversal of the normal loading pattern of the cannon bone is what causes this crack to appear on the front of the cannon bone. These are quite easy to diagnose. Every trainer can diagnose these. The horse comes out of the workout or the race uh, walking dinky, a little bit lame, a little bit sore, run their fingers down the front of the cannon bone and you can feel the edema fluid inflammation beginning right in the area where this little crack or this little fracture has occurred. These take about uh, one month to heal completely, uh, in an, that's on average. Some horses a little faster than that, others a little slower than that. But looking at them uh, in the post-mortem room and histologically, it's on average about one month before that little fracture is completely healed. Of course, if you take the horse right back out and start working him again just the way you would have been working him before, uh, then he's liable to buck his shin again, crack it again, or maybe he'll do it with the other leg. So this is a warning that you're going too fast with the horse too early. You need to slow up, back off a bit, give him time for this bone to finish growing and remodeling into its adult form because it is still growing and remodeling as a two-year-old. 
still getting itself into the proper shape to deal with the new loads of high speed and carrying weight. And this is when these little cracks tend to occur. They're also associated, though the argument still goes on, with our dirt tracks in this country. The frequency of buck shins and young horses in this, and young thoroughbreds in this country is somewhere in the neighborhood of 65 to 70 percent, while in a country like England where they race on turf, it's only about 5 percent. So there's an obvious difference and it's related to the kinds of surfaces upon which uh, we race our horses. Dirt tracks are not particularly good for shins. There have been instances of English horses or Irish horses, French horses that have been racing on turf all their lives, be get to be about three or four years of age and be ship shipped to this country to work and race, and they will buck their shins as three and four year olds when they meet our dirt track conditions. Not all of them do, of course, but enough of them do to make the case about the different types of surface. Now, we will move on. Oh, while we're here, this is the inside of the leg. And this is the little splint bone running along here. It's difficult to dissect it out so you can really see it, but I'm kind of plucking away at its lower end so you can see this little splint bone. And there is a fibrous ligament, an interosseous ligament it's called, which attaches that splint bone to the cannon bone. When that tears, with inflammation occurring, we have a splint develop in this area on the inside of the front leg. First a green splint, soft and painful, and as healing progresses, new bone forms, it becomes uh, quiet and is no longer uh, any problem whatsoever, except as perhaps a cosmetic blemish. As a horse ages, as they get older and older, there's a tendency for that little ligament to ossify normally so that the bones are fused together. So you don't often, or rather un uncommon, to see splints developing in older horses. It's interesting that 85% of all splints occur in the front leg, 15% in the rear leg. If they occur in the rear leg, they occur in the opposite side, on the outside, the other splint bone. And this has to do with the conformation of the joint surfaces and the way the load is applied. Most splints, uh, I said they were easy to diagnose. You just, you, the horse is a little lame and you feel down the leg and you can feel this soft swelling and he will be tender in that particular area. <coughs> Causes of splints, uh, it is a very, in a very general way, it's just simply a matter of too much loading of the immature leg, going too fast, too soon, before this ligament has had time to, begun to begin to ossify and, and uh, therefore stabilize uh, the system. They're not serious, they're cosmetic problems. Uh, they, they, as I say, they quiet down and cause no lameness once they have quieted down. There is a condition that's called blind splint, where people say that the splint develops on the inside between the splint bone and the cannon bone rather than on the outside, and that this presses on the suspensory and causes lameness. No such entity exists. It's never been demonstrated ever at postmortem, and what they're really describing when they describe blind splint lameness is damage to the upper end of the suspensory ligament that we already talked about. Now we can move on down to the fetlock joint. This is the lower or distal end of the cannon bone, the upper end of the first pastern bone, the long pastern bone or the proximal phalanx right here. And here are the two proximal sesamoid bones that we've talked about before with the suspensory coming down to insert on them. Now this is a very very interesting joint because it really is two joints in one. This is the front and this is the back of this distal end of the metacarpal bone. And you see that there's a dividing line between the front and the back, that sort of darker colored area right there. And actually, if you could run your finger over that, you'd feel that there's a ridge there. There's an obvious ridge down the middle here and a lower ridge which runs all the way across from side to side. This articular surface in front of that ridge is for 
P1 for the long pastern bone. That surface behind the ridge articulates with the sesamoid bones. So we really have a metacarpophalangeal joint and a metacarposesamoidian joint. They're continuous with each other, but functionally they are separated. Normally, the sesamoid bones should stay behind that ridge. If they go over that ridge, troubles begin. Thoroughbred racehorses, jumpers, will have damage in their fetlock joints to one degree or another. It just goes with carrying or pulling more weight than that system was designed to handle. What happens very simply is if we load this normally, the fetlock angle should be about like so. It should close to about that much. If it closes further than that, it has gone beyond its normal limits. The front edge of the long pastern bone is smashed up against this area right here on the cannon bone and arthrosis occurs. Ulceration of cartilage occurs in both of those areas. When that ulceration occurs, there's an inflammatory reaction in response to it. That inflammatory reaction, of course, is swelling, heat, and pain. And you will feel and see that quite readily on the front of the fetlock joint, and that's what's commonly called a green oscillate. It's not an oscillate at all. Oscillate means a little bone. And it's not that. It's arthrosis with the inflammatory reaction as a result of that arthrosis. This is the commonest lesion of all in the fetlock joint and therefore the commonest lesion of all in all horses. When that joint moves too far like that, as I've indicated, it also will tend to pull the sesamoid bones over that ridge that's running across the joint. When those sesamoid bones go over that ridge, it's like a car hitting a bump in the road. There's vibration, jerkiness, as they bounce over top of that ridge. Now obviously this is not a jerkiness that you can see readily with the naked eye, or at all with the naked eye, but it does occur. As a result, arthrosis develops along that ridge on both sides, and also right along the base of these proximal sesamoid bones. In this instance, when that damage occurs in that area, the swelling, which we saw occurred on the front with the oscillate, occurs in the back, right near the sesamoid bones, as one might expect, and usually that's called a wind gall. I don't know why it's a gall, and I don't, other than a gall just means a lump or a swelling. I don't know why it's wind, because it's full of synovial fluid, excess synovial fluid produced because of arthrosis in these areas. So those are the two major areas for arthrosis in this joint. Now sometimes you will hear of chip fractures coming off this P1, this long pastern bone, the front edge of this. Very often these are nothing more than the osteophytes, the repair osteophytes that are forming as a result of the oscillate type of arthrosis. Similarly, with the damage which occurs at this ridge and on the base of the sesamoids, you'll see new bone formation, osteophytes forming along the base of the sesamoid bones, and they will often be called chips, but they are in fact most often are osteophytes. This one here in the oscillate area, once that cartilage has been damaged, new bone begins to form, and then you can get a true so-called chip fracture, which is really a shear fracture occurring because of the damage to the protective cartilage in that area. Now, two other conditions which occur in this area, though they're not of the joint itself, <clears throat> one is sesamoiditis, uh, which is an avulsion of ligaments which is insert on the proximal sesamoid bones, both above it where the suspensory inserts and below it where these ligaments which continue the suspensory action occur. This again is related to too much movement, too much dorsiflexion, as I call it, too much, some people call it extension, of this fetlock joint. If that over dorsiflexion or too much extension of that joint occurs too quickly, 
very, very quickly, it pulls these sesamoid bones over the ridge, ridges very fast. As a result, there will be a fracture, so-called base fracture of the sesamoid bone. This is most common in thoroughbred racehorses. Standard breads occasionally fracture their sesamoids, but they usually do it in one sesamoid bone in the left rear leg for very peculiar reasons which we can't get into now. But this base fracture of the sesamoid <coughs> is, is a, a good example of simply overloading this joint so that it moves too fast and too far. It occurs most often, uh, we see many more of these in this country than in racing in other countries, and this is directly related to the fact that we race around rather short, sharp turns. In England, Ireland, France, where they tend to run around long dog leg turns or even whole races on the straightaway, sesamoid bone fractures are quite uncommon, but they are quite common in this country. In fact, they are the primary lesion in most cases of breakdown of horses on the racetrack. A good example of such an event was a, a match race some years ago, and I'll not use names, but two horses, very good horses, were racing against each other. The one horse was, as they were coming down a straight, the one horse was bumping up against the other one. In fact, that horse was on a round gallop, so which is an unstable kind of gallop. Finally, the other horse moved away. This horse came over to bump again, and there was nobody there to bump, so simply overloaded the fetlock joint on that side and smashed both sesamoid bones. You could virtually see them break on the videotape of the patrol films. Concerning treatment of these problems of the fetlock joint, I'm afraid I have the same sad sort of stories to tell as I have about other treatments. Arthrosis cannot be healed by any human intervention or any medicines of any sort. Healing must just take place in due course, which as we've mentioned already with the carpus, takes time. It has to be scar tissue form and then that scar tissue will gradually become a particular type of cartilage called fibrocartilage, but it will never get back to being the normal hyaline cartilage again. The only thing one can do is to simply lay off, give the horse some rest. When you start back to work, go carefully. Be sure that the horse is not overweight. Be sure that the riders are not overweight because it's overweight is part of, not the whole story, but part of the story for why these lesions have developed to begin with. This is as true of sesamoid problems uh, obviously, if uh, we could have many fewer sesamoid fractures in our racing horses if we had different turns on our racetracks, specifically if those turns were banked according to the speeds at which the horses run. We bank the turns for automobile races and for motorcycle races, and we should bank the turns for racing horses as well. They're all banked to a certain extent, but I know of none in this country that are banked for the kinds of speeds they should be banked for. As a result of that, abnormal loadings are put on the leg as they go around those turns.